I don't think it hasn't started to churn yet. Oh, it'll get there. I don't think That's I can show it. Can I show it? Lava lamp. Oh, lovely. Oh my goodness. I haven't seen a lava lamp in years. So we are officially live on YouTube. Sorry, go ahead, Chris. I'm good. Okie dokie. Um, we're officially live on YouTube, which means we can get started. Um, welcome everybody. Thank you all for saying hello from where you all are. We've got Calgary, Oakville. I don't actually know where Yarker is, but hi, Kim. I didn't know you lived in Yarker. <laughs> um, and we have uh, Charlie Lake, BC, 100 Mile House, BC, Thunder Bay. Oh, I love Thunder Bay. Um, Guelph. Windsor, all sorts of wonderful places. Thank you all so much for introducing yourself. Newfoundland, um, Saskatoon, sorry, Saskatchewan, Balcares, Bal Saskatchewan, Vancouver, um, Sutton West, all sorts of wonderful places. Thank you all so much for introducing yourselves. Uh, I guess we should probably introduce ourselves. So I think everyone knows us at this point. Um, I'm Jenna. I'm the Outreach I'm, Coordinator. And I'm Chris. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to be talking today about uh, binocular astronomy and we're also going to be touching on some Halloween targets because Halloween is just around the corner so um before we get started for those of you who are on zoom um I'm going to run a quick poll to see how many of you have done binocular ast astronomy before um so we'll get that started right now and while we do that we'll just briefly touch on the things that we have with us today which is for me I left I had I do have a big pair of binoculars for astronomy they are in my car with all my other astronomy stuff, because I am lazy. And if I don't have it with me, I won't do it. Um, and I have my little baby binoculars here, which I take on, um, they're small enough to fit in a dry bag. And so I take them with me on camping trips um, and that sort of stuff. They aren't great for astronomy, but um, they are the best binoculars are the ones that you use, right, Chris? Absolutely. All righty. So we'll end the poll in five, four, three, two, one. And it looks like we're going to have a very uh, attentive and excited group of people here because 80% of people said that they have done binocular astronomy before. Um, so we are here for you today so that we can go over some targets that are good in binoculars. Um, David even says that they use binoculars more than telescopes, which I actually, I would agree with as well, David. I don't use my telescope as much as my binoculars. Yeah, well, you know, we we uh, we did a binocular session uh, last December, so December fifteenth, twenty twenty. If you want to put the the link in, you can. People can go back, but don't don't watch until later. And uh, and what's great about binoculars is that, of course, you know, there's different things to see throughout the year. Um, but you know, having said that, I'm not going to spend too much time, if any, on the hardware, what binoculars are, and that kind of thing, or shopping. Um, I will recommend if you want to learn more about binoculars is um, uh, you can take a look at the Backyard Astronomer's Guide, the new book. The new edition of the book has just come out and there are, I think, a dozen pages, a whole chapter devoted to selecting and buying binoculars, comparing the types and the brands and the features, the coatings, all the different things that are important. And then they follow that up with a set of binocular sky tours through the year, though. So at any given time, there might only be one tour that's usable. Uh, and even for the Southern Hemisphere, which is great. So that's a great, a great resource as well. Um, I'm just going to go ahead, Jenna, you were going to say something? I was just going to say, I think we touched on hardware in our last episode. We, we did a lot more hardware talk in the last We episode. definitely did, yeah. Um, yeah. So I've just thrown that link down in the chat. Uh, you also get to see our, actually, Chris, you've been keeping up with your haircuts. You can see my hair growth over the <laughs> past year. <laughs> So I just wanted to point out a couple of other resources that are handy. Uh, so there is one here by uh, Stephen Tonkin, who does a website called The Binocular Sky. And he does a monthly news bulletin about what to look at with binoculars. So if I click on the current issue, you'll see there's a PDF here. And he runs through a variety of types of topics, types of targets, including deep sky, double stars, variable stars. Um, solar system objects, um, you know, um, paths of asteroids and things like that. So now we're nearing the end of October. So this information is going to be superseded shortly. Um, but what you can do and what I found handy is if you go back to the previous page and go into his archive, 
then if you want to get a jump start on November, just go to last year's November. And much of that will be valid because it, you know, only the solar system material will, will be much different. So that's a great um, resource for getting some additional tips on what to look at with your binoculars. Um, I've written a couple of articles over time uh, that were published on space.com. One was on, um, well, one was a little more hardware focused, one was a little more uh, target focused. So I, I don't know if Jenna wants to share those, but um, if you search uh, site colon space.com and then my name, then you'll, you'll find a number of things there. Uh, let's I'll see, I mentioned- them. I'll share them in the chat. Uh, yeah, so, um, so what are, what's great about binoculars? Let's just sort of do a little recap of that and then we'll jump into some of the things we can do with them. Let me just stop my share here for a second. So basically binoculars, depending on the, you know, the two numbers, you've got your 10 by 50, which means that the, the number before the, the X is the magnification amount. And the number after the X is the aperture. So a pair of binoculars like these ones, which are tiny little, I think they're eight by 23. So they don't do much, but I mean, if that's all you've got, that's certainly fine. If you've got binoculars you use for birds, you use for baseball games, you use for the, for the opera, take them outside on a clear night, they'll work. If you, have, if you wanna see more faint things, then you need the bigger aperture. So these are 10 by 50, which is kind of a gold standard for astronomy. The reason they're the gold standard is because they're not too heavy, but they, add, they gather a lot of light. They've got healthy 50 millimeter apertures, multiply the, and, and magnify the sky by about 10. So the 10 by 50s will actually gain you about five magnitude values over what you can see with the unaided eyes. So if you can see stars to magnitude three and a half in the city or something like that, binoculars will, will jump that to, to eight and a half. And if you're in the country and you've already got magnitude five, six skies, you're not gonna go, well, you're not gonna go all the way to 12 perhaps, but you're certainly gonna go much, much deeper. So, so that, that's a great advantage to seeing the binoculars. They've got a, a terrific wide field of view, which means you can see lots of sky at once, that, which is really helpful for searching for objects. And the other is that they're viewing with two eyes at the same time is more relaxing. And I think it does deliver a more um, impactful image to your brain, your, your wiring in your brain to use both eyes at the same time. So I think you see more than you do with one eye. And I think, um... I think I mentioned this in the, the, the last time, but this is, it's really important for kids. I think like kids have a hard time um, using one eye to see stuff, yeah, especially younger kids. And so having two eyes, both eyes open makes a lot, is a lot more natural um, for younger observers because they're not sitting there. Cause oftentimes you'll see kids look into a telescope and then close their telescope eye because they're yeah. not really catching. Or their head will be tilted the wrong way. Cause the, the binoculars help with the eye, the eye placement, the head positioning. Mm -hmm. So that's a great idea. Yeah, so if you've got a grandson, a, you know, a grandchild or something, or a niece or nephew that seems to have a spark of interest in, in astronomy and space, strongly consider going the binoculars route before you go the telescope route, um, especially if they're, if they're quite young. Um, when we do outreach, we find that kids that are under grade three have that problem where they can't, not all of them are easy, easily able to look through a telescope eyepiece. So. Um, that's a great way to get an early start on some of those things. Uh, let's see, what else can we say about this? So um, it's a great time of year to talk about binoculars because in autumn, the sunsets come earlier and all the summer, many of the summer targets are still visible because the sun is setting so much earlier. So we are losing some of the extreme Western constellations, but we still have Ophiuchus. We still have Sagittarius for part of the time and Scutum. And so some of those uh, summer Milky Way nebulas and things like that are still in the mix. Um, I'm not gonna talk too much about those today. I thought I'd really emphasize the, the true deep into the autumn target. So we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, don't forget that there's binocular information in the handbook. So there's, there's um, hardware and buying tips in page 60 of the handbook. And there's also a section called Wide Field Wonders on page 328 which talks about some of the bigger, bigger scale objects in the sky. Since you mentioned it, 
2022 handbooks are printed they're not i think they're about they're about to go out i don't think they've gone out quite yet but this is next year's handbook and the next year's calendars have also been printed so uh they are on their way for those of you who are already rask members these are included in your membership um and for those who aren't these are great guides to all of space all right so let's let's dive in and start going through some of the things that we can use binoculars for in late october november of this year so first of all, the moon is a no-brainer. The RASC has several moon observing programs, one of which is binocular focused. And the moon grows large enough of binoculars that you can easily distinguish the dark mare from the bright highlands. You can see some of the curved mountain chains like the Apennines and the Alps Mountains around Merimbrium. You can see um, the ray systems that are emanating from you know, craters like Tycho and the asymmetric one that's near, near Proclus. Um, you can observe libration of the moon as it wobbles and tilts, as you watch something like Merchrysium migrate closer and farther from the lunar limb. Um, let's see, lunar occultations. Every now and again, the moon will pass in front of a star. You don't need a telescope to see that. You can usually, you can often see those just using your binoculars. So that's a great thing that you can do a more, um, more bucket list sort of a sort of a, an event that you can see without a telescope. So that's kind of a neat one. Um, if we ever get another great comet, binoculars are good for comets. Let's hope that's we get good. another Neowise. Neowise was good in it. Neowise, the only way I found Neowise was using binoculars. I used yeah. my telescope once I'd found it in binoculars, but it was the scope was too narrow a field to really hunt for it in the sunrise. Binoculars are the only way I could get it. All right. So let me share my screen and we'll get a little more specific here. So this is the sky tonight from the latitude of Toronto at about 7 p.m. local time. So I got 1900 showing here. And I've, I've picked a nice uh, orange ring to show the field of view of, of, of 10 by 50 binoculars in honor of Halloween here. So um, one of the things to be on the lookout for, we're gonna talk, we're gonna cover the moon next session um, because the moon's gonna do some cool things coming up. But one of them, uh, an early heads up, is that the moon will, will experience the lunar X phenomenon on uh, November 11th, and that'll peak at 7 p.m. in the evening. And if you've got, if you maybe put your binoculars on a tripod, that would be probably your best odds of seeing the lunar X. It's a little bit small, but if you've got um, a tripod mounted binoculars, relatively more powerful binoculars, or if you've got image stabilized binoculars, I happen to have image stabilized binoculars, which are too fancy. So fancy. But uh, but they'll I've seen the lunar X in those. Those are those are 10 by 42, but the image stabilization makes it steady enough to see it. So the tripod would do it for you. Uh, that's November 11. We'll we'll talk about that next time. Uh, what else we have? We've got um, the asteroid series. So series is actually late at night. Let me just advance this. In here. So the asteroid Ceres is sitting here near the face of Taurus the bull. There's Ceres. And over the next couple of weeks, it's actually going to, let me just center this so you can see better what's going to happen here. Here we go. It's marching up. Oops, I'm doing that right. Here we go. Towards Aldebaran. So on the 6th of November, You'll have no problem finding Ceres by using Aldebaran, even, the, even a few days before and after. So that's a great opportunity to allow you to see um, something like Ceres with your binoculars. It's only magnitude 7.8 or so, so it's bright enough to show in binoculars. And the star might, might interfere some. You can see, you see with the field of view of binoculars here that they're relatively tightly spaced together. So the glare of, of Aldebaran might spoil the party a little bit, but if you go a day or two before, so there's, there's a couple of days before and there's a couple of days after, and then it's gonna spend the rest of the month going right through the middle of Taurus, which is kind of neat. So let me just, I'm just gonna bring up my bookmarks here and load some of these bookmarks up to show As you. As you're doing that, I'll just shout out to uh, The Expanse, which features Ceres prominently um, and is 98% of the reason that I have any interest in finding Ceres. Oh, good. We have, and I'm sure, I mean, it's great in its own right, but um, if you have any interest in sci-fi um, and space-related observing, we have an entire episode on that from a few months ago on our YouTube channel. 
All right. So a couple of other th cool things that are coming up in the next little while. Uh, let's let's go back to let's go back to now. I'll just go up a little bit further on here. So we've got the moon next month is going to do a visit with the planet. So it's going to pass by um, Venus and then Jupiter and then Saturn. So let me see if I've got dates here. Okay, on the seventh. Let's try the seventh here. Yeah, so there's a nice conjunction of the pretty crescent moon with Venus, and they'll share the field of binoculars on November 7th. And then on the, let's see, I think it's the, yeah, around the 11, 10th, 11th, you've got the moon not quite fitting the field of view with um, Saturn, but you might, you might get lucky, it might work. No, yeah, the 10th is definitely the night. Um, and then the following night, it'll hop to sit and sh with Jupiter, share the field with Jupiter. So you better pick up the four Galilean moons plus Earth's moon in the same view. So that's kind of neat if you, if you cool. look for the moons of Jupiter. That's a cool one. Um, Neptune and Uranus are both in the sky. Let's just go back. You can see them in binoculars when it's moonless. So right now, tonight, we've got a moonless evening. And if you want to look for You've got Jupiter and Saturn are sitting here in the southern sky after dusk. And then Neptune is here sitting here between the ring of Pisces and kind of the knee of Aquarius. So there's Neptune. And what you can use to help you find Neptune is use your binoculars and look for the bright star Hydor, which is unaided eyes. You can see that easily. And then in your binoculars, you should be able to pick up this little clump. You've got a trio of Psi Aquarii, kind of a triple star there. And then uh, it's Chi and Phi Aquarii. So all the, all the neat Greek letter name stars. And then follow that sort of three, one, one, and then jump to the left. And that's where Neptune is. So Neptune's magnitude 7.8. It's a little dim, a little faint, but look for something that's bluish, a little dot that's bluish in that patch of the sky. So that's, that's all pretty much all night long, they'll be available. And then Uranus comes up early in the evening and it'll be better, maybe a little bit later in the evening, get around the clock. And, and Uranus has been spending this year right below this kind of making a narrow triangle with the two bright stars in Aries, Hamal and Sheridan, right, right below them. And for reference, you can look for the, the ring, which is the, the head or the tail of Cetus the whale, depending on how you picture him. Or you can also you can also look for the bright star Menkar and the bright star Hamal, and it's sort of on the midline between them. And that one doesn't have really quite as many cool markers to help you. But again, there are a number of stars in the same field that are about the same brightness, about magnitude 5.6. And then Uranus will be the bluish green one that twinkles less than the other ones, if you want to see with that. All right. Let's talk about asterisms and we'll start with the, so I'm gonna sort of go from the early evening to later evening. So starting in the Western sky and migrating over to the Eastern sky. So some asterisms, let's see if I've got the bull. Where's my bull? So up here in Ophiuchus, there's the bright star Sabalrai, Sabalrai. And then just to the left of it, there's a V of stars. I don't know if you can see the V shape. And it kind of resembles the, the shape, the face of Taurus the bull. It's called um, Poniatowski's bull, or the bull of Poniatowski. It's got different names. So that fits nicely in your binoculars field of view. And again, you can just look for the constellation, or look for the star Celebri. There's also an object called the Summer Beehive Cluster sitting nearby where's the summer beehive that was around here somewhere maybe it's this one might be this one i'm not sure but that you can check out that one um then you got the coat hanger which is a, a popular with everybody so there's my coat hanger here so the coat hanger is up here midway roughly midway between vega and altair the coat hanger will nicely fill up your binoculars field of view and when you're looking at the coat hanger, see if you can notice that, a, that most of the stars are white. 
but there are, are three stars that are um, reddish or, or orange, sort of tinted, more warm colored. So, so this one, this one, and the one at the end of the row here. And you can see that there's the bar of the coat hanger, there's the hook underneath it. So for us, it's hanging inverted. And this is great because the, the coat hanger is better to look in binoculars than in a telescope. You get the, the true shape of it by doing it that way. Uh, while you're around, you go up to Lyra. So let's go up to Lyra, which is nearby. There we go. There's Lyra. So Lyra's parallelogram fits relatively well in binoculars. And when you're here, see if you can notice, you'll, you should be able to see that you've got the, the delta Lyra is a double star. So you should be able to, you might even be able to separate that with your unaided eyes. You've got good sharp eyes. Um, then above Vega here, we've got the double double, which definitely splits nicely in binoculars. And then of course, if you have a telescope, you can get that to split again and make four stars. Um, we've also got uh, Zeta Lyra here, and it may or may not split in your binoculars. It's hard to know, but give that a try. That's a challenge for you to see if you can split that one. And then we've got also, I think it's Sheliac that's double. Yeah, Sheliac is a, a double that's not too tightly spaced, but see if you can do those with your binoculars. If not, then, you know, grab your telescope and, and try it that way. And also you've got V1, V and V1 are new, I guess those are new, new, new one Lyrae down your Sheliac as well. Um, one of the things that's fun to do, as I was saying, is, you know, put a chair on the driveway, grab your binoculars and pick a, pick a little constellation like um, Sagitta, the arrow, and just learn it. You can have your sky atlas with you and you can just go through star by star, notice the different, compare the different magnitudes, compare the different star colors. Um, if you've got dark skies, you can look for Messier 71 right in the middle of the of the the arm the um the shaft of the arrow. So that's what you can try for. I don't know if you can pick up, yeah, this this uh, this nebula, I don't think it's going to be bright enough. If you've got nice dark rural skies, you might be able to find that NGC 6823 nearby. It's relatively large. Okay. And above that, right above the arrow, you've got the Dumbbell Nebula. That's a planetary nebula. And again, you can see it's very tiny compared to the binoculars field of view, but I'd be curious to know if anybody has seen it with binoculars or, or could see it in binoculars. So again, that's kind of a challenge for people to try out. If you have seen it in binoculars, um, let us know in the chat as well. Yeah. Uh, Delphinus. Delphinus is another cute little constellation that practically all fits in your binoculars. And again, you can look for the sort of pair of stars at, at Radonav and Suolosin, Su, 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 I'm not sure how you pronounce it, will look like a nice pair in your binoculars as well. So you can check that out. This globular cluster here, no, it's a little bit faint, Caldwell 42. It's a little bit faint, but you can give that a go. And then you've got the Aquilius as well in the same neighborhood. So all these little um, mini constellations are sitting up here sort of between Pegasus and near the Summer Triangle. And then don't forget to shift over and look for M15. And M15 is, is easy to find. If you can find the neck and face of Pegasus and just continue that line by about half their separation, then this is usually pretty easy in binoculars, even from the suburbs. That's messy 15. Magnitude have, only 6.3. We have... David Pickles saying that they see, they've seen um, M27 with Canon 18 by 50 image stabilized binoculars. All right. Which is so nearly a, a telescope. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm going to have to give those a try myself. Good to know. Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Thanks, David. All right. How about a couple of Kembles? So Lucien Kemble is a Canadian. Um, I believe he was um, uh, a priest or a, or a Jesuit priest or something like that. And he's been, uh, he discovered a number of, of interesting little asterisms that bear his name. So one of the most famous ones you may have heard of is Kemble's Cascade. And that's sitting here in the northeastern sky in Camelopardalus. And if you look for this star sort of along, Camelopardalus doesn't have very, very bright stars, but if you can find yourself, here's Murfak, the bright, bright star in Perseus, and just sort of hop kind of an Algol of Murfak distance to the left, 
And with the binoculars, look for this long chain of stars, Kemble's Cascade, that's called. And you should be able to pick up this, uh, this cluster at the bottom as well. There's an open cluster near the bottom end of the Kemble's Cascade. So that's a cool one to try for. Uh, let's see, how about the mini Cassiopeia? So the mini Cassiopeia or Cassiopeia is near Polaris. So here's, let me just get this out of the way. Here's Polaris. So it's a little bit to the upper right of Polaris at this time of the year. And look at that. Bump, 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 bump. Aww. Little Cassiopeia asterism near the star Alakanon or Chi Draconis. And so we saw the cascade. We saw the mini Cassiopeia. This was called Kemble's, Kemble II, by the way. And there's also Kemble's Kite. And that's over here. This is a little hard to see. So it's kind of a diamond shape. And then a few stars making a tail. And this is sitting right near the, right above the star Gamma Camelopardalis. So that's, that's a great binoculars target to try for as well. Uh, there's one called Eddie's Coaster, Eddie's Roller Coaster. Let's see where this one is, Eddie's Roller Coaster. So there's Cassiopeia, the real Cassiopeia now, the big one. If you look for the star Navi and head towards Polaris from Navi with your binoculars. So sign up, put Navi on the one edge of your field. And if you look here, you can see there's kind of a double hump. There's a bunch of star, a ring, a chains of stars come up, bup, 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 then dip down, and then go bup, 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 and then dip down. It's kind of a neat double hump. So that's called Eddie's Eddie's roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Want to look for that one? Uh, I saw the kite. Yeah. So those those are so those are some asterisms. Here's another neat one. So around this time of the night, let's go back to southern view of the sky. So when you face south on uh, late October, November evening, and you can find the great square of Pegasus about halfway up the sky. So there's the zenith here. So it's two thirds of the way up the sky. The eastern edge of Pegasus, so Alpharaz and Alginin, is almost, is almost parallel to and very, very close to the prime meridian of the celestial of the celestial coordinate system. So the, the prime meridian of the celestial coordinate system would be from Polaris, southward to the constellation of Octans in the Southern Hemisphere. And it has the coordinate of right ascension zero. So that's the right ascension zero line. And if you draw the, on Stellarian, we can draw the, the lines here. So there's the prime meridian running right down here. And so the actual zero right ascension line is about Two thumbs widths, maybe, to the upper, uh, the upper right of the edge of the square of Pegasus. That actually, that line actually passes very close to the, the star Calf in the top tip of, um, of Cassiopeia as well. So that's cool. And if you want to know where the actual zero zero is, let me just bring up the, whoops, there's my ecliptic. So the zero zero point of the sky coordinate system is in the night sky nowadays, and it's sitting here. I'll just get rid of the grid so it's a little less cluttered. So it's right near the ring of Pegasus, the ring of Pisces, that western ring of Pisces. And there's this, this would be close to the point of zero right ascension, zero declination. So the coordinate system of the sky. Um, the ecliptic runs through zero, right? In celestial coordinates. So the reason that this is the coordinate system origin point for the celestial sphere is that this is actually the uh, point of the vernal equinox. So if I were to center the star and change the date to March 20th, around 12, the sun sits on that spot at the vernal equinox in March every year. So that's the, uh, that's the point. If you want to see it for yourself in your binoculars, I mean, there's not a lot of landmarks there, but you can go back to, let's go back to the night sky here. You can look for the star, I think it's this one, XZ Piscium, and that's very, very close to that spot. So from here, you can just go down and look for these two or three other little medium bright stars, and you'll know that you're looking at the coordinate system center point. 
Right. Any questions? I'll pause a sec. Yes, but they uh, are moderately unrelated. One is really cool though. Um, so there was a comment from Graham White saying that they found that a small child blow up pool without the water in it is great for binocular astronomy because you can rest your head on the rim of the pool and get- Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Which I think is a great suggestion. <laughs> um, and the other was a question from Jamie, which is the coolest question I've ever heard. Um, observing with night vision goggles as opposed to binoculars. Have you heard anything about that, Chris? Does it work? I have heard of it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure how it works. Um, but it's, it's not inexpensive. No, no, not at all. Yeah. <laughs> but it'd be very cool. I mean, it would be, it would be the sort of thing that you'd want to like borrow a pair from one of your military buddies, maybe before buying two grand worth of night vision goggles, which is what the internet told me is how much they cost and the time it took me to since yeah. that question has been asked. <laughs> yeah. My daughter and I used to watch Mythbusters. And so we were always thinking about, oh, wouldn't it be cool to buy night vision camera or a high speed camera or something like that? And it, it, they're pricey, those things. Those two those are, are neat toys. It would be very cool though. But yeah, if anybody has uh anybody has experience with that sort of thing let us know that's that'd be cool to know all right let's let's talk a little bit a few more double stars so i mentioned some earlier in lyra just to wrap up here so there's one uh, let's see how about uh let's go to so in pisces we've got here's the square of a pegasus again so if you go kind of to the east of the square of the eastern side of the square of pegasus down towards the bright stars, Hamal and Sheridan. You can look for Psi, Pegasi. So you've got this chain of one, two, three, and then you've got Chi as well. So that makes a neat sort of asterism. Easy. Those are um, basically a naked eye or a naked eye um, double or triple star system. Uh, then we've got in Andromeda nearby. We've got, so here's Almac. So here's Mirac. And then you've got 56 Andromedae. It's a nice, easily, fairly easily split double star. And you've also got the bonus of the Caldwell 28 or NGC 752 open cluster right beside it. So make sure you notice both of those things if you're there. Uh, let's see, how about, well, let's go to, where's Kuma first? Here we go. So up here in Draco in the Northern sky, here's Polaris right here. You've got the head of the dragon and the star Kuma is a relatively wide double star that you can pick up with your binoculars. Uh, and then, let, yeah, let's go later in the evening now. So if we go into the eastern sky later at night, and let the Taurus come up. So in the Hyades cluster that makes up Taurus's face, you've got Lots of lots of multiple, lots of clumping of stars. So you've got a Hyadem three here. This is actually theta one, theta two. Sometimes uh, Stellarium assigns strange names, not always the best name to a star, but but basically there's you've got this double. That's an easy double on the cheek of the bull. And then you've got down here, you've got Sigma one and Sigma two tori right below Aldebaran. So that's a great one that you can see in your binoculars, probably even with your unaided eyes. And just to finish up, let's go to, once Orion comes up later, so you can save this for next month, is I always like to recommend the star Sigma Orionis, which is below the three stars of Orion's belt. And the three stars, of course, are great for binoculars as well. But Sigma Orionis is neat because it's got this little sort of dark shape, narrow triangle, multi-star system. So that's a great one to look at. All right. So let's talk some deep sky observing then. For that, we're going to go back to tonight's sky. So try to get to this one relatively early in the evening once it gets dark, because of course, Ophiuchus and Sagittarius are starting to set after dusk. But Remember, here's that, here's that V of Taurus that I showed you before, that false, false V or false bull in Ophiuchus. And then up near the border between 
Serpens and Ophiuchus, you've got two fantastic open clusters that share the binoculars field of view. So this one's called Graf's cluster on the left. And then on the right, we've got the Tweedledum cluster, which is a bit more compact, a bit smaller. Um, Stephen O'Meara likes to call this one the Tweedle D cluster instead of Graf's cluster. So we've got two Tweedledum and Tweedle D together at the same time. Cute. Is that something you could see from a city, Chris? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Shouldn't have shouldn't have too much trouble with um, with binoculars on these big open clusters. That should be fine. Let me just crank up my numbers here. Some of these might be IC optics. There we go. So it's not a it's not an NGC object. So it was switched off. Its symbol was switched off. So the this is an NGC new general catalog, and this is a as an integrated um, index catalog object. So that's again. So you can look for you can look for um, Altair and come down to the right towards the Ophiuchus, the sort of Dalek box of Ophiuchus, and pick up those right in between. So those are great. Um, also, still earlier in the evening, we've got Deneb right nearly overhead here. So let's go pick up on Deneb. So if you aim your binoculars just to the lower left of Deneb, you can should be able to pick up the North American nebula, especially if you have a rural observing site. And you're just essentially looking for, you won't see the color, but you'll see um, a brightening of the sky that'll, you know, that'll nicely fill your binoculars field of view. So part of the trick here is to recognize how big things should look, should look and therefore there you can confirm that you're seeing them if they're about the right size in your binoculars. And this is all part of the same cloud of gas. You can see there's the zenith right there. So it's nearly straight overhead at 8 p.m. local time tonight. And so that's where your, your, kid, your, your kid's swimming pool will be a great hill. <laughs> Lie down and look straight up. So you might be able to pick up the, the void here, the dark dust that forms the Gulf of Mexico. Look for the little star that forms Orlando <laughs> right here. And then if you have enough magnification, you should be able to pick up. There are a few open clusters scattered here and there. It's a very rich part of the Milky Way that we're looking at. So, so look for that. The dark lane of dust that separates the North American nebula from the Pelican nebula. It's just they're the same cloud of gas. They're just there's foreground dust that's just cutting them from, from one another. So you should be able to maybe see that as well if your skies are dark. All right, we talked about the dumbbell. How about the Andromeda galaxy? That's a favorite. Mm, there's a few times, so like the North American Nebula, there's a few objects that are actually better almost in binoculars or wider fields, fields of view, because if you get a telescope out, sometimes they're, they're too big for the telescope. Yeah, one of the things that, that helps is to be able to, um, be able to, to be able to surround the object with lots of dark sky. So you need a bigger field of view to get that dark sky. So you can see the, the margins better. So that's a great one. That's a great example of that. Yeah. All right. So we're now, uh, again, about 8 p.m. We've got the great square of Pegasus. And if you head a little bit to the left, there's a couple of, couple of ways that you can find the Andromeda galaxy that are pretty easy, even from the city where it's not that visible without help. Um, so one way you can do it is you can start at the star Alpha Rats and look for, kind of follow the stars of Andromeda. So you've got Alpha Rats, that's, that Andro that's Princess Andromeda's head. Then you've got Delta and this star, Eta, that's her shoulders. And then you've got Miroc and Mu, that's kind of her waist. And then down here, you've got her feet stars, Nimbus and Almac would be her toes. So if you stop at her waist and then sort of hop from Merak to Mu and double that distance, you'll find the Andromeda galaxy. The other way of doing it is to use the upper half of Cassiopeia as a giant pointer, and it points straight towards the Andromeda galaxy. And again, you can see that it really nicely fills up your binoculars field of view. So you'll almost have a better, a better view of it in your binoculars than you will in your telescope. Highly recommend that. So that's a great one. I don't know if you're going to be able to pick up 
M32 and M110, the little satellite galaxies in your binoculars. Let us know if you've done it or if you can, that would be uh, good to know. They're a little bit small. Okay, in the same neighborhood, we've got the Triangulum Galaxy. Triangulum Galaxy I usually find by, by identifying the three stars in the constellation Triangulum. They make a nice um, obvious right angle triangle here. And again, you can refer to um, Hamal and Sheridan and the bright star Mirac and know that you're looking, you're hunting Half, about halfway, a little more than halfway between those, those three stars, that trio of stars. But if you look for the right angle of triangulum, you can start with the sort of Western tip and go up. You can even share the field of view. So if you put the tip of the triangle in the bottom of the binoculars, then the triangulum galaxy should be at the top. And this one, I'll just get rid of the symbols here. You can see so this is less bright than Andromeda because it's, um, it's more face onto us. So the light is spread out a little more, but um, lots of people have seen that in binoculars. Um, people have even said they see it with their unaided eyes from dark sites, rural sites. So wow. it's magnitude, magnitude 5.7. So it's relatively bright. It's just it's low surface brightness. It's spread out a little bit. And size wise, you're talking about, here we go, one by uh, one degree by 41 arc minutes. So it's, you know, larger than the full moon in diameter, the full extent of it. You'll probably just see the core of it in your binoculars, but um, definitely worth going after. All right. Same neck of the woods, double cluster. So a lot of people notice Andromeda and then notice the bright fuzzy patch of the uh, double cluster sitting right to the to the left or lower left of it. And it's also easy to find because it's kind of midway between the, the W of Cassiopeia and the bright star Murfak. So just keep, cast your binoculars in that general vicinity and you'll pick up, you'll pick up the double cluster. So when you're looking at the double cluster, NGC, um, it's 884 and 869, you'll notice that Few things to notice are um, one is more compact, one is more di dis dispersed, diffuse, and you'll also notice. I you don't know if you'll see this in binoculars, but definitely in a backyard telescope, that the lower one has some golden stars in it. So if you could see some of these, I'm clicking on these hmm. these differently colored golden stars. Do they really which are not gold when you're looking at it? Um, you should be able to. You should be able to see the contrast in the color to some extent. That's very cool. But again, it's something to add to your your things to do, or things to look at, or things to look for when you're observing these objects. So just some extra bonus bonus aspects. Uh, yeah, they're they're supposed to be. Um, they've been described as golden suns, eighth magnitude golden suns. So take a look at that. I always have, I don't know about everybody else here. Let me know what you think. Okay, Linda says the gold shows quite easily if you take the time to breathe them in. Um, I am colorblind, so I'm terrible at this. <laughs> so people have been uh, like, oh yeah, that's totally blue. And I'm like, uh-huh, sure, yeah, totally, 100%. Yeah, also you can look for this kind of another asterism here, this sort of a, um, a thought bubble sitting right above the double cluster if you wanna see if you can notice that as well. That's cute. A couple more, let's see, we've got, so we're now kind of moving into the Western part of the sky here. So down to Murfak. So a lot of people um, notice Murfak, it's very, very bright, magnitude 1.75, but take some time to look at it with your binoculars because you can pick up the dazzling scattering of jewels all around Murfak, these hot O and B class stars. Um, they're collectively known as Malat 20 or the um, Alpha Persei moving group. They're basically um, all sibling stars that were coalesced out of the same common gas cloud that are now traveling as a cohort through the Milky Way. And so um, it's really stunning in binoculars. It's well, the best way to look at them is in binoculars. And again, you can look for things, little, you know, odd, odd, odd balls in here. So there's a golden star. Uh, a case, a K-class star that's not like the others 
that's in the same field of view as well. So that's the MRF, the one, the MRF, alpha Persei moving. And then everyone's favorite, a lot of people's favorite is the Pleiades. So the Pleiades at this time of the year, this isn't really getting above the treetops and housetops until after 9 p.m. But of course, it'll get higher and higher every week as we go by here. And what's great about the Pleiades is that more and more is revealed as you magnify the object more. It's a definitely a binocular showpiece, right? I mean, um, if you've got a, um, a low focal length refractor that has a wide field of view, then you can appreciate the Pleiades. But if you've got an SCT, like a, 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 an F10, um, schmidt cassegrain 8 inch or 6 inch or something like that, you don't really fit the Pleiades into the field of view very nicely in that. Mm -hmm. So that's where you want to step away from the telescope and grab the binoculars and really enjoy. Um, but when you're done, come back to the telescope and start looking inside because there are little double stars and things like that buried inside the Pleiades. I think at least one of these is part of the uh, RASC double star observing program, one of the oh. stars in, inside the Pleiades. I will send the link to that for anyone who's interested. I think it's our newest observing program. Yes, definitely. I'm nearly done. I only have, I think, really? seven of the stars left to get. I've been waiting for the year to turn oh. for uh, Lupus, Lepus, and uh, Orion to come back around. Oh, man. So, didn't that only, really didn't there. that program only come out like six months ago? Uh, last spring. Oh, yeah, I think okay. last spring. Yeah, okay. Good yeah. for you. You're on top of things. Well, doubles are great because um, they're, if you're trying to find things, um, I, well, they're hard, a little easier to see, but obviously a little easier to see. Um, and, but they, they're all different. So what I loved about the, what I love about the program is that um, if I don't research ahead, what I'm going to see, then when I, when I dial it in and look at the eyepiece, a lot of times I'll be surprised with, with what I get. It might be a triple. It might be an interesting pattern or shape. It might be a terrific different, you know, color contrast, something like that. So well worth it for sure and you can do it from your driveway don't go to a dark site yeah it's the best part about stars star specific observing programs is that things like globular clusters double stars they're all pretty visible from the city so a um, few more things about the pleiades uh we have this um dust foreground dust that's um that's reflecting scattering um preferentially the blue starlight from the from the members of the cluster so if you have a very dark site, you might be able to pick up some faint reflection nebulosity around some of the members of the, of the, uh, of the cluster as well. And, you know, a lot of people mistake this for the Little Dipper because you've got kind of handle and then kind of a four stars making a, a bowl. It's a much, much smaller than the Little Dipper, obviously. But um, the stars, these two stars that are ostensibly the handle of the false little dipper are the parents and these are the daughters. So these are the daughters of Atlas hmm. or the seven sisters and other cultures think of this as the, um, the portal to the afterlife, either, either where's your, either where spirits travel to when you pass or where um, humans may have arrived on earth through the, the celestial portal. Um, the, um, the South Sea Islanders call this Matariki and they use this when they, um, when it returns into view in the morning sky every year, that triggers their new year, and uh, and it links into their their sailing season, their fishing season, and that kind of thing. So it's lots of interesting lore around the Pleiades. All right, let's go. We were already we already visited the Hyades, but of course, you know, <clears throat> do pay, do 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 some appreciation of the Hyades. The Hyades is the one of the nearest open clusters to the Earth. That's why it's it's so dispersed and spread out and large in the sky. It nearly fills the binoculars field of view. Note that Aldebaran, though, is not part of the cluster. So most of these stars are all siblings of one another, but Aldebaran is about half as far away. I think most of the stars are about uh, 146 light years, and Aldebaran is only 66, 67 light years. So that's a great one. And last up in terms of deep sky is when it gets late at night or when we get later into the season is just use your binoculars on Auriga and you can pick up all those great 
open clusters. Oh. So Messier 37, Messier 36, Messier 38, and then there are even other bonus ones as well. So those are all visible in binoculars that done this. All right, I'll pause. Any questions? We don't have any questions right now, but if there are um, if there are questions, please do throw them in the chat or into the Q and A. Um, lots of comments about light pollution and just the struggle of trying to deal with it in a city. But the clusters, mm -hmm. they're good ones. Yeah, so I haven't I haven't emphasized too much the nebulas, which mm -hmm. are still pick, you know, we can still pick up a lagoon and, and, and omega and the ones that are in the summer Milky Way. <clears throat> I've emphasized more open clusters and things like yeah. that, which are definitely accessible from the sub from the suburbs with binoculars, no problem. Yeah. And the double stars. Yeah, double stars are great. All right. So I'm gonna put these bookmarks away and I'm gonna pick up my spooky Halloween bookmarks. Woohoo! Halloween time. We'll switch horses. I'm gonna go to now. All right, so I'm going to now. And we'll face this. Oh, there's a there's a question from Douglas. Who is Eddie's roller coaster named after? Who is Eddie? I don't know. Somebody Google that while we're I'll while I'll we're look talking. it up real quick. <laughs> yeah. Um I probably read it, but I don't remember. All right, so um, before we get into what to look at, a couple of interesting aspects of Halloween. So the, the timing of Halloween or All Hallows Eve um, is not, it's not coincidental, it's actually by design. Um, the date of October 31st uh, approximately marks the midpoint of the season of, our, of autumn. So, between the, the, the start of each season is dictated by the sun's motion along the ecliptic, either north or south of the ecliptic, <clears throat> north or south of the celestial equator, <clears throat> or hitting the cross points where the, where the ecliptic passes, intersects with the celestial equator for the um, equinoxes. And halfway between, or roughly halfway between the beginning of each season is the midpoint, and those are called cross quarter days. And Halloween is actually um, one of these cross quarter days. It's actually derived from a, a pagan festival called Samhain, and uh, which was um, observed by Celts and Druids in the old times. And it it also marks the end of the harvest season and the beginning of winter time. So you're kind of um, celebrating the harvest, bringing the harvest in, and getting ready for the winter time. Um, now. It used to be set at about the, they used to set Samhain to about, about November 1st. So if November 1st is the day, then the eve before is All Hallows Eve. So that's Halloween is the day before November 1st. So really it used to be November 1st that was the important day. Um, the true astronomical cross quarter day though comes about a week later. So this year, the true midpoint of autumn will fall I think I noted it as November 6th, late in the, late in the day on, on November 6th. Um, and at that point, the sun will be very close to the star Zubinul Ganubi in Libra. So let me just bring it up to November 6th here. As you're bringing it forward, I have an answer for the Eddie's roller coaster question. Okay. Uh, which I posted in the Q&A, but it is named after someone named Eddie Carpentier, who is, who is a British amateur astronomer and the British Astronomical Association, not the Canadian ice hockey player named Eddie Carpenter. Um, All right. That was named in 2013. And so that's a good point, Dennis. So we, we could challenge our viewers to discover some more. Yeah, if you find some, you might get some named after you. Yeah, if Lucy and Kemble can, can get a few, then why can't any of us do that? So exactly. that's, that's that should be with the Rask's uh, goal is to, Rascal's goal is to get Stephen, some more. Yeah, Stephen Dow says WCO near Akatox, which is completely, I have no idea what that means, but that there are Rask members who have maybe have things named after them. I'm going to look that up. Okay. We could do a topic on that one day, uh, oh. celebrating dis dis discoveries of Rascals in the past. Yes. 
Yeah. Oh, 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 sorry. This was my apologies. Um, we should do that. We should do rascal named objects um, at some point. But Stephen Dow was responding to a question in the Q&A. And if anyone over on YouTube has suggestions as well, I'll bring them over. Um, searching for binocular astronomy locations near Calgary. Sorry, I understand. Oh, uh, okay. Wilson right. Cooley okay. Observatory is near Akatox, is what Stephen was saying. Okay, okay. Sorry, back, back to what you were talking about. <laughs> That's okay. Um, just finishing up. So the other cross quarter days, um, other than Halloween, would include Groundhog Day. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. May Day in early May, and Lamas on August seventh. So those are the uh, the other three. And again, they because the, um, the because of the Earth's elliptical orbit, the lengths of each month of each season of the year are are they'll have different numbers of days in them because the sun is moving faster and slower at different times of the year. We'll come come back to that. All right, talking about Halloween, let's go back talk about Halloween. So a few more interesting things. So Halloween, there are two meteor showers in the process of ramping up. So we have the northern and the southern Taurids meteor showers are, ramp, are just ramping up. So they don't peak until later in November, but um, those are both, both showers are produced by debris that's been dropped by comet um, Enki. And so uh, the particles that are dropped by Enki and producing the showers have been known to produce fireballs. So you might get some uh, occasional Halloween fireballs, if you keep your eye up, eye on the sky. And this year we have a, a relatively moonless Halloween, so. Oh, is, that, is that extra spooky or is that not spooky enough? Like is the full moon the spookiest or is it spookier to have it darker? I have to admit last year's full moon on Halloween was pretty good. That was kind of nice. Yeah. I think, yeah. I, think the, I think the light from the full moons provides just enough light for the extra spookiness factor that is required for a good Halloween. Yeah, so, I mean, people can vote, but I, didn't, I don't mind the moon. Well, <laughs> some people don't like it. I don't mind the moon. All right, All right and, now let's and, do a few, a few spooky, um, uh, scary named objects. So one of the first ones is the witch's broom again, sort of moving from the west, east, western sky, east. So the witch's broom is part of the Cygnus loop or the Veil Nebula. And as Jenna knows, if you have a dark sky location, you can see the Veil Nebula in binoculars. It nicely fills the binoculars. And yeah. the easiest way to find the Veil Nebula is to start with Cygnus's main stars, find Deneb, find Albireo, find the a northern and southern wing, and then head down the lower wing, one joint, two joints, stop midway between them and look for the star 52 Cygni, which is a naked eye star, um, just to the kind of southwest of those two joints. And if you center that star and zoom in, a section, a bright section of the Veil Nebula goes right through that same field of view, and this has been this has been nicknamed the witch's broom. So that's a cool one to look for. All right, the next one I have down here is the skull nebula. Where's the skull nebula? So the skull nebula is, is tiny. So we're not talking binoculars anymore necessarily, right? That one was, but um, that one's also a good telescope. The witch's broom is is most visible with an oxygen three filter or a, an ultra high contrast nebula filter if you have it. Um, but some of the, a lot of the, the ghostly objects in the nighttime sky are planetary nebulas that resemble faint planets and things like that. So they're ghosts of Jupiter, ghosts of Saturn, ghosts of Mars. This is the skull nebula. Skull nebula in telescopes or in, in long exposure photographs shows um, kind of dark patches of, of um, missing gas that kind of rem is reminiscent of eye sockets and that kind of thing. So that's your, let me just pull it and take off the stars. So that's your skull nebula. That's in Cetus. So if you look for the back end of Cetus, sort of this V shape, and it's nestled in between there. Again, kind of near Pisces in that kind of area. Owl cluster, and then Jenna's going to jump in with another 
I, love, I don't even have much to say about it. It's just one of my favorites. <laughs> Owl Cluster is one of my favorites too. It's in Cassiopeia in the sort of the bottom half. If you take Navi and Rukba and make a, a right angle triangle and look at that patch of sky and you pick up the Owl slash ET slash Dragonfly cluster, you've got two brighter stars. So Phi, Cassiopeia, and HP 6229, HIP 6229 are the eyes. The body are a sprinkle of stars that extend upward to the right here. If I flip it around, that's the north. Yeah, upward to the right. Your telescope will likely flip it upside down. So now you can see kind of the shape. You've got the eyes, the body, a couple of stars for the feet, and then squint your eyes and you can see curving chains of fainter stars up on each edge, up in each direction for the wings. So let that's us, the- Let us know if you see an owl, a dragonfly, or ET in that set of stars. I haven't got a poll ready, but I personally only ever see a dragonfly. Oh, interesting. Okay. I see the Can owl. See I see the owl. Um, uh, Phil Chow, who we know, some of us yeah. know, he's a rascal. He likes the, I think he likes the ET uh, designation better because he likes the fact that one of the stars looks like it's his fingertip glowing. Oh, all right. All right. I'm Fair not enough. sure which, that's pretty cute. yeah, I'm not sure which star it is, but he likes that. So that's cool. That's the owl cluster. Um, let's talk about the demon star. So that's spooky. The demon star is Algol or Beta Persei. And Algol dims in brightness for a total of 10 hours. Every, let me get the number here for you, every two days, 20 hours and 49 minutes. And the reason that's such a, um, a specific time cycle is because it's an eclipsing binary star system where um, a small companion star is orbiting edge onto the Earth's point of view. And as it passes in front of the primary star, the total light output is dimmed. And so we get a reduction in brightness by, let's see, a magnitude of, I think, about from 2.1 down to 3.4. So it basically more than halves in brightness. And it ramps down, and then it ramps back up for a total of 10-hour period. And so then the Observer's Handbook and some other websites, you'll see that there are minima of Algol listed for specific dates and times. And if you start watching the star at those minima, then over five hours, it'll rebrighten. Hmm. Conversely, you could start, you could note the minimum and find out whether the star is visible five hours earlier and watch it dim for five hours. So you could do it either way, depending on the timing. And because it's, it's not an integer amount of Earth's day, then the algols happen all around the clock. So you need to pick up one that's convenient for you. You now and explained the line in the observer's handbook that I always look at and go, huh, don't know what that means. So thank minimum you. Minimum of alcohol, yeah. yeah. So here's, here's a, this is really a, a really cool ex- accessible variable star and it's really easy to, easy to use. So when algol is at its regular brightness, it's the same as almac. And that's very easy to see with your unaided eyes. Just go and, and find Murfact, the bright star in Perseus. Here's algol, the one to the right lower right. And then is it the same as Almac? Then it's currently in regular, regular phase of its cycle. But if it's dimmed, it'll be as dim as the star, Gorgonea tertia or Rho Persei, which is just a finger width or two from it. And so when it's at its minimum, you should be able to go outside and see, yep, they match. And five hours later, it should be, yep, those two match. So that you can, you can visibly easily see it happen. So that's a great one. So um, it vary, when it's going to be happening for us will vary by your, you know, by your time zone sort of thing. But if there will be a minimum happening. Uh, let's see. I've got one on Halloween night at 5.32 p.m. Eastern time, which won't be, let's see, Halloween night at 15.32. So it'll still be daytime for us in the Eastern time zone. But by the time we get a couple hours later, we'll be on our way and it'll spend the evening climbing the Eastern sky so you can kind of watch it. But yeah, grab the handbook, 
You can also, there's also a tool, maybe Jenna, you could share that, um, yeah. that web, that link. Sky and Telescope has a tool where you can dial in and it, it gives you both the local time for you and the universal time for you. So that's really easy to use that. All right. Witch's Head Nebula. The Witch Head Nebula. I like this one. So the Witch Head Nebula is a reflection nebula. So again, it's that dust scattering blue light. It sits here right near the foot of Orion, Rigel. And I'll just get the sky a little higher, a little darker. So this object is faint. Um, it's, it's a great uh, imaging target. Um, you can see that it's quite large. So it's, you know, there's my field of view of binoculars. So it's stretching quite a across. If I um, actually take off the sky here, you'll see a little bit better. So there's the witch's head. And it's measures about from chin, from her chin to the peak of her hat is sort of, where are we at here? Almost five degrees of the sky. So it's quite big. And I'm not sure which is the star that's um, producing the, the starlight that's being scattered. It might be, looks like it might be, um, it might be Psi Eridanus, the star nearby. Or it might be Rigel, I'm not too sure. That depends on the relative distances of the objects. So the witch head is, it says it's, uh, doesn't say the distance here. I'm not sure the distance. So, so that's something you could, you could research and find out. Okay, so there's a few more. Um, also in Orion, we've got M, let me just turn on the messages here. We've got, a Casper the Friendly Ghost, can I make it happen? I'll do it this way, there we go. So Messier 78, which is up near the belt of Orion, has been nicknamed the Casper the Friendly Ghost Nebula. Cute. So that's neat. Um, the Flame Nebula, which is up here beside Alnatak, has been called the Ghost of Alnatak. Oh yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, I didn't mention Mirak's ghost yet. Mirak's ghost is back here in Andromeda, near the Andromeda galaxy. So you need a telescope for this one. If you zoom in to Mirak, look for a faint, a faint galaxy. I'm um, just sharing the field of view of Mirak. You might need to hide Mirak outside your field of view a little bit cool. in order to pick that one up. And then you said Owl Nebula. I like the Owl Nebula. I don't know if owls are particularly Halloween-y, but I just think they're very cute. And I think it counts. The problem, only problem is that um, at this time of the year, so there's the Owl uh, Nebula. Not up. So it's, it again, it has the dark, the darker patches that sort of look like an owl's face. But the only, uh, yeah, the only caveat is that in late October, it's uh, very, very low in the sky. Oh well, so, save it for save it for the spring when the owls come back. Yeah, you could you could look at it maybe right after dusk, or you could look at it late at night when it's rising up in the wee hours, or save it for spring. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there's a ghost of Jupiter. There's a ghost of there's a ghost of Mars. Ghost of Iota. Let's see which one is the ghost of Iota. I've heard of in. the ghost of Iota before. Is it mentioned in here? Hmm. It's not mentioned in here. I forget which which NGC that is. I'll look it up. There's, right a, there's a King Hamlet's ghost in Leo. So yeah, has anybody else got any other suggestions we can we can share with uh, the viewers? Googling ghost of Iota provides absolutely nothing useful. So I apologize. I don't know if I'll be able to help on that one. If there's any Halloweeny targets that you can think of the names of, please share. Chris, have, did you, sorry, I've been looking things up in the background. Did you, did you show the ghost of Jupiter? Uh, let's see, ghost of Jupiter, is it here? Because I really like that one too. It's not this here, let me look up. There it is. Ghost of Jupiter here. So that is, oh, no. that is visible. Let's see, let's see if that comes up. Does that arise for us? So that's pre-dawn, that's in Hydra. So the time of year to see that one would be 
kind of late winter or maybe in the summertime. Let's see when we can see that one. Yeah, maybe February, March time frame. Okay. So that one's neat. Yeah. There's so the ghost cool. of Jupiter. Yeah. Ooh. And there should be, there should be a ghost of Saturn here as well. Let's see if we can do Saturn. And while you're looking that up, John Peddle suggested the Wizard Nebula, but that's also the same thing as the Witch Nebula. Um, so that one is also very cool. If we if you look at it very closely and also look up images of it, I think it's the same as the Witch Nebula, right? No, it's a different one. Yeah. Oh, well, it looks very similar. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we're um. There's also the ghost of Cassiopeia, um, which is a target that actually we're trying to image right now with the robotic telescope, and the data will be released uh, with Sky News. I'm just going to add this Wizard Nebula to my list. Okay. Cool. Did you find any luck with the ghost of Iota? No, it didn't come up much, unfortunately. Okay, I'm not sure where I saw that, but anyway. So. Can I, I share a I'll, photo of the ghost of Cassiopeia just because yeah, it looks really, really cool? I'll just stop. Um, Go ahead. Let me, you get to see all of my research going on in the background. Um, so this is the ghost of Cassiopeia. And the reason it's so cool is, is well, it's, uh, one of the reasons it's a difficult target is because there's this bright star in the field. But that's mm -hmm. lighting up this sort of like ghostly figure, which is turned 90 degrees, but you get the idea um, facing towards the star. So the data for that one that is being released, Sky News has purchased all this data from our robotic telescope and is giving it away for free. Um, and so you can practice playing with it and trying and entering contests with like editing and stuff like that. This one's really tricky because you have this really bright star in the field. Um, so it might be a more difficult target. Still very, very cool. And I think, uh, ooh, Jamie's suggesting black hole targets as well. Like um, the one at the core of M87 and stuff like that. Cause they're kind of spooky. Oh, if you want to see, yeah, if you want to see, um... Black hole, you can look for uh, the neck of Cygnus. Cygnus X1 is still up. So for that, you want Eta Cygni. Eta Cygni region. Let's go here. And I'll share my screen and I'll show you that one. I also have another suggestion from C. Oda on YouTube as well. Two different ones. Okay. So... It's it. I think it's this one. Yeah. So just for context, so here's Deneb, here's Sadr, here's Alberio. And if you look sort of halfway between Alberio and Sadr, which is the, the heart of the swan, you'll see a, a medium bright star named Eta, Eta Cygni. And then right above that, there's a couple that you need to do some star hopping to find it. But the star you're looking for is B1357 Cygni, or in your, your hand controller of your go-to telescope, you might use HIP 98298 or one of these other designations. And that is the blue giant star that's in orbit around the Cygnus X1 black hole. Cool. You're, you're actually seeing the companion in the black hole when you're seeing that star. That's very cool. Yeah. I have... We have to wrap up very soon, um, but I have two last targets suggested by C. Oda. Um, so Chris, I'm stealing your screen sharing. I apologize. Oh. Um, so, and, I, and a question from earlier as well. So the first target is this, which is a series of IRAS 054372B, there's a bunch of numbers, et cetera, plus 2502, which is a very cool looking nebula, not very well known, but very, very pretty. Um, and Beautiful. then the other one is, the Hand of God Nebula, which looks really, really cool and very creepy um, from NASA. Oh, so neat. those are two other really cool nebulas. And then there's a question from the audience before we get going, um, which was, can we see Comet Leonard? I had not heard of Comet Leonard, so I had to do a little bit of Googling for it. Let's see if it's in here. It's It sounds like it's quite new. So if you haven't updated your um, Stellarium with new targets. I did it. I did do it recently, but let me just check and see. C2021 A1 Leonard. C-20. Yeah, A1 Leonard. Discovered at Mount Lemon. A1 Leonard. It passes closest to Earth on December 12th, 2021. 
Also, just a heads up, you're not sharing your screen if you wanted to. Oh, I will. Yeah, let me just do that. I stole it from you. So it rises at about 2 a.m. right now and is visible. Um, Stellarium is not always good. It's generally good with the positions, but it's not always very um, accurate on the, the magnitude. So what I often do is I'll use, um, I'll use this website, aerith.net. And if you click here, then you can see a bit of information. You can see um, observers reports showing the, the, what they've seen as the magnitude. Yeah, so, so we're not anywhere near when it will be good. So they're predicting mm -hmm. that around late December, it'll be up to magnitude four if this holds true. Fingers crossed. So that's, a, that's one to watch for. Yeah. And what we can do here is we can actually plot where it'll go. So I can go to my ephemeris tools and I can go C2021. A1 Leonard between now and let's say, let's go to December 31st, calculate. So there's the path over the next number of months. Cool. So, yeah. Cool, it'll be close to Arcturus then. That'll be kind of helpful. Is that the direction it's going or is it what going to say? Way? Let's say around the December. Let me try that. Let me just center that up again. There we go. Yeah. It'll be near Arcturus around that time. Nice. Exciting. Bring up the day. So that's let me just bring this back to the morning sky. So it's kind of pre-dawn, as nice. some of these are. But yeah. Thanks for the tip. We can only hope um, that it performs as NeoWise did. All righty. I think that wraps up all of our targets for today. Oh, I forgot one thing. What'd you forget? I forgot one thing. Let me share my screen again. This one's cool. Your final bonus. So oh. every year around this time, let me just get rid of my ephemeris. And clean up. Okay. Let me get rid of my so I want. So every year around this time of the year, or the week before Halloween, Arcturus becomes the ghost of summer suns. And what that means is that if you go out and look at Arcturus at, say, 7 p.m., it's exactly where the sun was at 7 p.m. in July. Huh. So if you see where the sun is in this view, and I'll go back to Arcturus. So cool. right around the 23rd to 24th of um, October. So Arcturus gets the nickname, the ghost of summer sun. Cool. Huh. That's cute. Thank you so. for the last bonus target, Chris. Fantastic. All righty, we're gonna wrap things up. Next session is on the moon because we have the Lunar X coming up on the 11th of November and then the lunar eclipse, 97% lunar eclipse on, um, November 19th? Yes. Uh, somewhere around there, yeah. yeah. And we're going to talk about the lunar geology. Uh, I haven't decided which section of the moon to focus on, but I've got some really interesting information about basin rings and sub rings and Ooh. slope features, and it'll be great. Awesome. Can't wait. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. It was great to see you all again. It, all, it feels like a really long time between these sessions, so it's always really nice to connect with you all again. And um, thank you for carving out some time to hang out with Chris and I, and we will see you in two more weeks um, at the next session. Keep looking up. Keep looking up. Happy Halloween. Some clearer skies, right? Please, someone somewhere.